All right, welcome back to the InterAxis YouTube channel and InterAxis.io. Uh, this lesson we're going to talk about wallets, and we're going to talk about wallets um, in the cryptocurrency digital space. Now, I'm not going to go into an in-depth discussion on what a wallet is and how the software works. For that, there are plenty of other videos you can go find online. Uh, maybe one day we'll actually do that lesson. But for the time being, uh, go look at one of those if you don't understand exactly uh, how wallets work. What we're going to talk about is um, where wallets are now, where we think they will go, and uh, how that impacts you and why that is important now and, and in the, the near and distant future for digital assets and, and cryptocurrency and decentralized finance. So. Um, Again, we, we go back to uh, the history and, and kind of where we started with wallets. And of course, the history in this perspective is not going back to the uh, early 1900s like we did with custody, but it's going back to like 2009. And we had paper wallets. And a paper wallet, in this case, was really just you write down the, uh, the address of your wallet and then you could go on the Bitcoin network and you, can, you could actually send Bitcoin from one wallet to another. And then if I never log on, I, I can just write down my, my uh, wallet address, my private keys, go put them in a safe deposit box or in my drawer, and that's my paper wallet. Okay, it moved to um, software or soft wallets. Okay, and the, the soft wallet is was essentially could be on a uh, web browser or a phone or something, and it was just uh, software that kept track of your private keys and your, your wallet addresses. And eventually that software got encoded into hardware, and these hardware wallets were like uh, Ledger, Trezor, uh, there was KeepKey, which has now become Shapeshift, as the KeepKey wallet. Okay, these are hardware wallets that essentially have the software built into them. So you can plug your hardware wallet into your uh, computer. You can interact with whatever transactions you need, send, receive, and such. And then you can actually unplug it. So you can make your hardware wallet cold, so cold storage, which means you're you, you've unplugged your hardware wallet, you have it sitting in a drawer, or safe deposit box, or someplace to keep it safe. Or it can be hot, where it's actually connected to the internet, connected to the cryptocurrency network. And when it's hot, then you can actually interact with the decentralized finance ecosystem. Right? If it's cold, you can't really interact. If it's hot, you can be interacting, you can be uh, lending, staking, trading, exchanging, whatever else you need, you need to do when it's hot. So this is how we've gone in wallets from paper to soft to hard. So <clears throat> the, the hardware wallets really came about because um, the, the paper wallets were relatively safe and continue to be relatively safe from a hacking perspective. It's hard to hack a piece of paper, right? Except I could lose that piece of paper. I could lose my private keys. I could lose my wallet address and such. And once I've lost a private key, I can no longer go online. I can't interact. I can't get to my wallet and actually send Bitcoin or send Ether or send any tokens anywhere if I don't have the private keys to sign the transactions. Software wallets made it a lot easier, right? I can just log into a website potentially. I can put MetaMask on my browser, and as long as I have my, my password, my key to log into MetaMask, uh, I technically don't have to keep my private key written down anywhere. I just have my password. I can log in and interact. Well, this is less safe from a hacking perspective because if someone hacks my laptop and it has a, a key logger or something like that, they can watch what I do. They can then sign my transactions and send themselves Bitcoin or Ether or whatever it might be. A hardware wallet gets a little bit more safe because I can make it cold. I can detach this. And there's all sorts of safety and security built into these hardware wallets so that once I take them offline, take them off of my laptop, then no one can really hack them anymore. They have to wait, potentially, for me to plug them in, and then they're a little bit more susceptible. But once they're unplugged, they're not susceptible anymore. So what we've done is we've increased security from a 
hacking perspective, the hardware wallets make them a little a little safer than paper because um, paper, you know, gets wet, fire, such. Uh, y you can pretty easily lose paper. Hardware is a little harder to lose potentially, um, and there's a little more technology built into the the hardware. But essentially, what you've done is you've taken software and you've encoded it onto this hardware. So that's where we are with wallets now. Now, the, the, the key is where, where this is important and how it affects us is none of these wallets are, are very useful in terms of interaction unless we can connect them to some sort of network and actually create transactions and interact and trade and lend and, and everything else we want to do in the decentralized finance world, right? It doesn't help to have a uh, cold hard wallet with, with Bitcoin or Ether or any other sort of token sitting somewhere if you're not going to be able to use it unless your entire point is just to hold it for some indefinite amount of time, right? So these uh, software, the, these wallets now are, are becoming more, are, are trying to become more useful. So these software wallets are being developed um, Shapeshift is one of them, um, and, and several others. Argent is another that I've seen. Zerion is an interaction tool where they might hold your assets. You might be able to, to hold your tokens in them, but what you can also do is you can interact. So they, they provide you some level of self-custody, right? I own my keys, which means I can transact. So within the, the realm of Adam's wallet here, okay, I can perform certain services. Right? I can lend, I can trade, I can send, I can pay, Right? I could potentially buy insurance now on whatever is held in my wallet. And what I can do is I can interact, I can transact through the decentralized finance ecosystem with other wallets. Right? So I can transact with Ron's wallet, which might or might not be uh, a shapeshift wallet. It can essentially be any Ethereum or any, or any other type of wallet, and we can transact here through the decentralized finance ecosystem. Ron has his keys so that he can transact. I have my keys so that I can transact. We can interact with each other. We can interact with a smart contract. Right? And in doing this, we I custody my own assets, my own digital assets here. Ron custodies his own digital assets there. Um, and, and a lot of these wallets that are coming out, these new ones, have this ability to have all these services um, undertaken and, and interacted within the confines of their wallet, or they, they have kind of the wallet software, and then they have all these services as, as ancillary um, and easily accessible within their software. And so that's what we're, what we're seeing, is a lot of this push towards the ease of interaction and the ease of use. Once we've established now that Bitcoin and Ether and such are, are really here to stay, and not everyone just wants to hold them forever, we want to be able to use them. Okay, now these providers are saying, how are we going to make it better and easier for you to use the cryptocurrency you have, use the digital assets you have within the economy? So that's where these wallets are coming from. So contrast that with, as we talked about in, in the last session, some of the custodians, right? What the custodians, the crypto custodians have, is they have Adam's wallet, Ron's wallet in here, and they build a box around it. And this offers security for a fee, 
right? So there's a fee attached to this level of security that says they're not going to let anyone in and get my private keys and take my ability to interact. And within here, I'm guessing they're going to start offering their own services and their own lending and their own staking and their own trading and portfolio management within here. And there might be lesser fees if we're interacting with each other within the confines of the custodian because a lot of the, the network fees might not have to be undertaken quite as much. But the interesting thing is I am going to be able to interact potentially with this wallet and if I have these private keys that's held in this custodian, this custodial system, I can interact with other wallets that are outside of the custodial system. That's the nature of digital currency, of cryptocurrency, is it's all digital anyway. A wallet can interact with another wallet. So what is the custodian providing? They're providing some level of fee. What they're also providing is the fact that within our regulatory framework, there are some transactions that that require a certified custodian, right? Uh, some some uh, examples are if I want to get a bank loan, right? The bank might say, we will only accept whatever collateral you're going to provide for us if that collateral is held by a qualified custodian. Well, who's a qualified custodian? That goes back to a government regulation that deems that this custodian is qualified and therefore the bank can accept that collateral. Currently most banks do not accept Bitcoin or Ether or some sort of digital tokens or anything as collateral and part of the reason why is there isn't a qualified custodian holding it. So you have more custodians that are getting qualified and all they're getting qualified for essentially is to hold on to my wallet and my private keys and to put this framework around it. Now within that framework and part of the security, they're going to have some sort of insurance here. All right, they're going to be able to insure all of this, which makes me feel good. It makes me want to have my assets here potentially because I want to be able to interact with all these services in a decentralized way, I want to be able to get a bank loan and the bank to say, oh, you're with this qualified custodian, that's great. Your Bitcoin is there, so we trust it more than we trust it at this wallet, which is essentially a piece of software from a company we haven't heard of. All right, so we like that we as the bank like this, and the reason we like this is because the government has kind of blessed this company. And because the government has blessed it, they can go get insurance. But what we're seeing here in these software wallets that are coming out is I can go buy my own insurance in a decentralized way from some other third party. Right. So how this affects us and, and what we're going to see in the future is um, from a regulatory perspective, from a banking perspective, a loan perspective, a, a transaction perspective, are we going to go more this way or more this way? Is the idea of a custodian going to be more of a wallet with some sort of registered third party that maybe blesses this? maybe with a smart contract that says they have certified my wallet so then I can go take that and get a bank loan because I have this registered third party that insures it and guarantees that, that the money is there and maybe can put it into some sort of escrow account for the bank loan or are we still going to go the direction of having banks and, and brokers and such as custodians that are going to hold my software wallet offer all these services offer my ability to interact with other wallets and smart contracts and do all this for a fee because the government is going to keep blessing them with this ability to be a custodian. We don't know which direction it's going to go. We see it going both ways. Where uh, Another place where this is going to be interesting and, and come together is when we start to see more security tokens. And security tokens we'll talk about in another video, but security tokens are going to be a essentially a cryptocurrency or digital token representation of real assets. So if I own a piece of real estate, I can have a security token that denotes that ownership of real estate. That security token can be held in a wallet. And will that wallet have to be held with a custodian where I can interact with it? Can that wallet be held, be self 
custodied? Can I hold that security token in a self-custodied wallet and still interact with the rest of the economy in the same way? All right, so these, these custodians are here. They have these wallets to, to keep me secure, keep me feeling better. They're going to charge a fee. They're also going to give me better uh, interaction potentially with the traditional and fiat worlds, right? So the custodians give me the ability to trade my fiat currency, my dollars, for cryptocurrency more easily. This, some of these wallets are giving me that ability. They're having to connect with some of the custodians like a Coinbase or a Gemini or, or some of the other money transfer agents that are able to convert my fiat into some sort of cryptocurrency. So the, these larger custodians are wrapping all this up, wrapping all these services together under their, under their umbrella so that we feel better and we're able to transact better in this uh, traditional financial world that we've grown accustomed, whereas these software-based uh, wallets, these new ones that are coming out with all these DeFi, decentralized finance options available, um, are offering all these same services. So in terms of how it impacts you and, and why it's important. Um, what, what we're trying to understand, what we're trying to get at is we want to be able to interact with the wallet no matter where it is. The idea of custodians is probably going to change. Um, they're still go probably going to have to be somewhat regulated by the government in order to uh, transact in the, in the bank world and in the insurance world and such. But there's going, to be, um, there, there's going to be some changes in what we see as a traditional custodian and what we see in terms of what wallets can offer in, in custody services. Uh, because wallets now are, be able, are, are able now to offer so many more services like the lending and the trading and the stinking and the insurance and everything else that are mirroring a lot of what a custodian can offer. So, that's our talk about wallets. If you don't really understand how wallets work, we're going to put some links to some YouTube videos or some other videos where you can go learn a, a little bit more about how they work. Um, it's, they're really important to understand that this is how wallets, whether they're with custodians or not, this is how we're going to transact and interact with the digital finance world uh, in the near future and, and definitely in the distant future. So. Uh, don't forget, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Check us out at interaxis.io and on Twitter at interaxis8. Thanks.